Hello and welcome to episode 3 of my ESR meter build, or as I like to subtitle it, Johnny builds an ESR meter despite not passing QA, making a whole bunch of bludges, and even a kludge or two. So in episode 1 I did a quick ESR for dummies course, demonstrated how to measure ESR with an oscilloscope, reviewed a large number of different ESR designs, picked one, breadboarded it, and got it to work. Now in episode 2 of my series, I went through the process of taking my breadboard design and converting it over to a PCB design. I also picked out the chassis I was going to use and its physical layout, and then took my paper schematic with all its annotations and converted that into a digital schematic, which I used to do a layout, and finally with a product called PCB Babita Box, I created the actual board. So for those of you out there who watched all the way to the end of episode 2, you remember that I brought my nice brand new shiny PCB board in front of my QA manager with this result. Ah! Now my son of a bitch QA manager was quite correct. I did make quite a goof on the board. Down in the right hand corner where the op hat goes, I mixed up the connections for pin 5, 6, and 7. Pin 7 should have been connected across to this trace, and pin 5 should have been left unconnected. It didn't take long to correct that with the software, but I didn't particularly want to go out and redo the whole process of doing another board, so I just did this quick kludge. So after cutting through the trace that connected 5 and 6 together, I did a continuity check of all the other traces just to make sure everything was still okay. So with the first fix done, let's get on with the rest of the episode of actually putting the board all together. So now we come to our fun part. Putting it all together. So there's my nice PCB with my bodge line or kludge all done. Now, a lot of guys go out and buy one of these things first thing, but I find these little mounts really good for through hole stuff, but absolutely crap for uh, SMD. So what I like to do with SMD, we'll take it off of here, is get a nice flat piece of plywood and board it down there nice and tight. So it doesn't move around because when you're doing this stuff you're always like you're always very gently moving things and, and you're it'll move really easily <laughs> sorry we'll bolt that down right now or at least screw it down in there or tape it down nice and tight got a nice board so I don't burn the table at all or anything like that I should be all set to go all right so another thing I do I just zoomed out a bit here after showing you all those little bits and pieces, was that I always keep a BOM handy, which I go down through the list, and I check off the ones as I do them. I also have the original schematic, which I can always refer back to. I've got a layout schematic, which relates the numbers here back. I have my schematic, which I came out, keep that handy. Then I've got all the values written down where they go, linking back to this. So it's always good to have lots of examples of what you're doing. So, let's start off, and I'll get out some of the capacitors. And I think the first ones are 0 0.01 farads. So there's no need for me to put all my component soldering in this video, but I will stop when I'm doing something interesting. And the uh, first one's coming up right now. Turns out I didn't have the right size component for the pad I chose. So I have to do a little bit of a blotch to make it fit. Okay, so I'm going to try a different angle today because I kept thinking my fat head in the way the other way. Anyway, you can see I got all the capacitors installed and then I had to use a smaller one and just sort of bodge it here a little bit to hook it up to that one. No trouble there. I mean, I just did a little bridge to cover it across. Uh, a lot of the times you can use the bigger ones and the smaller pads, but you can't necessarily use the small ones on the bigger pads. But anyway, that was just a mistake of mine, getting that 2-2 two -two mixed up for a 3-3. Three -three. I never did have a 3-3 three -three in the right size. Anyway, next what's going on, zoom out here, is I'm going to put the ICs in. i got my ICs and my transistors here, right there, all nicely separated. And you double check, you triple check, and you four times check before you put them down. 
making sure you get them in the right spot. So we'll start with the good old triple nickel, which of course goes right there. One, two, three, one, two, three pads. So we'll get out the triple nickel, which I think is this one. And the loop to make sure I got the right one. Nope, that's the LM. Yep, that's the triple nickel. Place your so as you can see, it's fairly easy to make a mistake when picking out your uh, SMD components. So once this LM555 is down, I have to, I do my first blotch. And in this case, I use two very small jumpers to hook up pin 6 to pin 7, and then pin 7 over to the output. So I got my zero ohm jumper out. As you can see, my part, if you can spot it, is right there. Itty bitty little small thing. They're so cute, as my daughter used to say. So. So just a quick explanation what a bodge is, or more properly, a bodge line. When you have a PCB and you've missed some trace somewhere, and you have to put a wire between point A and point B, or disconnect a wire from point A B, it's usually been tradition to call it a bodge. Oh, that's a horrid bodge, but looks like it worked. There. Oh, that's absolutely horrid. <laughs> looks ugly as sin. <laughs> Ugh. Doesn't look any better in close up examination either. Okay. So, with the capacitors and ICs all laid, I continued on with the resistors. The only little sticky wicket I ran into was saying I had a resistor to place, but I had only a small one when I needed one for a larger pad. So, again, I just did the jumper thing. With all the surface mount parts done, I transferred the PCB over to the soldering bracket. So I'm going to do my first through hole part, which is my little picofair. Just clean that off with one of these things. If you can ever find one of these again, they're hard to find now, but they're a uh, little bit of wire on this. They're a cleaner. I haven't seen one in ages. I picked this up from one of the old guys, of course, at the radio club, who didn't want the damn thing anymore. So I'm going to fast forward through all the through hole parts. Uh, the only interesting thing was I did make one mistake. I forgot to hook up the output of the 7805 to the positive power rail. To fix that, all I had to do was leave the lead uh, coming off the 7805 a little longer and just bend it over and then solder it to the exposed pad. There we go. Ugh. I gotta go clean this mess off, but I think I got everything attached. So, all done. But how many blodges? Here, here, mm. here, <laughs> here. Uh, don't want to know. Hey, next step, once I got everything put together there, is I go through the whole board again, checking it with my ohm meter looking at it with the loop, going over my schematic to make sure nothing is buggered up, and then eventually once I'm all done that and it's really nice and clean, I'll actually go out and test it. Might be for another hour or two. Anyway, boring stuff. But before I do that, before I actually put any power onto it, I'm going to write up a little test program, a little test sheet so I know what to test and make sure what I'm changing. So the test functions should be fairly easy. First make sure that the triple five is giving me the right value coming out and then I make sure that it's coming out here. Anyway, I'll write up a test sheet and get that so I can have a test all set which I could repeat afterwards. I also go back and record all my blodges on a new piece of paper so I know to go upstairs and change my layout correctly. I'll use this piece of paper and put all the blodges in that I changed. I also notice that this one right here goes up and across so there's no need for that there anyway i'll go clean this up so just setting up for my tests bum, 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 bum. i had a little extra time today and i actually wrote up my test my tests what i'm going to do and the first one of course is a 7805 
7805 check to make sure that the voltage regulators are all hooked up correct. So, and I've got all my procedures written down on how to fix it. So, let's go through that right now. To me, the second most boring part of this hobby is going through a test case. The most boring is watching somebody else do it. So I'll spare you that, and I'll just skip along fast forward on this until we get to something interesting. Ah, crap. Ha! That's a problem. So, found my first mistake. Ha! Take that off of there. That's a capacitor. That should be a jumper. Oh well, time to fix that. Okay, yet another blodge done. Ugh. Quickly show you what I did. Ugh. So I uh, put that jumper on there, and then I added a little bitty cap across there where it's supposed to go. Oh, should be okay. Yep. And we do my tests here. Four volts. Four volts. Let's see what the jumper is. Four volts. Four volts, yay! So there's a good example of the utility of a test plan. I found that in this place capacitor right away. This wasn't the only design flaw my test plan revealed. I also made a mistake in putting the resistor and LED that was on my switch after the LM7805. I had too much of a voltage drop with that combination of resistor and, and LED. So I was getting less than 3 volts on the output of my power rail for my op amp and triple nickel. So I moved the resistor and LED to the other side of the regulator and my regulator still had enough voltage to regulate 5 volts correctly. Okay, back to testing. I've made my two blodges, put that there, got my cap there. I'm not going to bother testing the switch again because I have to install it and get all the wires correct and put my two jumpers in there and I don't really want to solder that to that before I have to. So. so once I had passed that test case, I went to the other ones, which a couple of them used the oscilloscope to make sure my triple phi was running correctly. And after I passed those tests, I moved on to the final test case. So let's give it a quick test just to see if it's working. I got a cap here. We know that right now it's at about 36. Let's put this cap on. It should drop a certain level. 31. There you go. So I know it's working. Well, I guess part three is going to be the shortest part, because absolutely nothing interesting happened when I was putting it together. You no, know, just had to stick the components together and wire it up. The only thing I had to do was the, adjust the zero bit with the two trim pots I had added in. And once that was done, it was all ready for me to use and enjoy. Okay, that didn't take too long to put it all together. You know, why bother looking at me just putting in screws and whatnot. What did take a rather long time was trying to get the circuit all nicely balanced with the two big pots. Uh, main problem with that was that I used a bad, my battery was going dead that I had in there, so it kept on dying on me. Long story short, after I put a new battery in, it only took about 20 minutes, 15 minutes to actually get it balanced correctly. As you can see, I got my little light going on on top, there. And if I zero it out here, it's all... Nicely zeroed, you put it in balance right there. And I can take my first little measurement. Uh, let's take a bad cap, where right? I put my bad cap. I'm always hiding in the... Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Oh, we'll zoom in there first. So I can get a good look. There we go. Negative. Yeah, you can see that. And that's about three or four. Never seems to work correctly the second time. There. Good connection, about five ohms. We take a 
really nice cap to say this Sprag. Rebalance it. It's a little off. It tends to do that every single time. Negative to positive. And that's right over almost zero ohms. Which is great. Yeah, let me zoom out here. So in the end, this is a really fun project to build. I, uh, my first op amp circuit I designed, or actually just stole and worked on, I, I did learn a lot, you know, difference between the different amp, op, amp, op amps and, you know, differing slew rates, all that fun stuff. And it was fun to build. And the question is, would I build it again, given the opportunity? Well, when you think about it, uh, this panel meter, this ancient Simpson panel meter, would probably cost you $15 uh, to replace. They don't make them like that anymore at Simpson. Uh, so 10 to $15 online for a good quality microamp meter and then you've got about seven to ten dollars in parts depending on what you look at I got most of these really cheap of course the chassis is expensive you'd even find a chassis like that it would cost you 15 to 20 bucks when you add all that up you know you, you can go out and buy a good little peak ESR meter that'll give it to your rate on without any trouble uh, I even get an even half the price I can get a cheap Chineseium one so in the end, what I'm going to use it for is perfectly fine. I have a lot of projects coming up that are going to have uh, power supply problems. And I want to look at the capacitors. A lot of the times the capacitors are still good. They might just have to be reformed. So this ESR meter will give me a quick check to see if I can reform or replace. You know, if the ESR is way down at this end at uh, five, four or 5 ohms, I could... Uh, try to reform the caps and see what they look like after. If the ESR is anything higher than 5 ohms, time to throw the damn thing away and start all over again. It's just a bad cap. And then actually after the reforming, I can check the ESR again with this to see if it's, you know, 2, 3 ohms. And also compare that to the capacitance. And, you know, both the, the capacitance and the ESR uh, the capacitance should be within tolerance, not too high, not too low, and the ESR should be low, and then you got a good cap, even a reformed one. So that's basically what I'm going to be using it for. Nice little thing. I'm going to put that on my bench now, and that'll be waiting for my next video, and I'm going to have to figure out which one that would be, either a build or a rebuild, but I think I've got a signal generator, or an arbitrary waveform generator that's got my name on it to fix it. All right. And that's it for now. Bye-bye.